Jesus was a masterful teacher, and when he really wanted to draw in his audience, he used an ancient form of story called a parable. Over one third of Jesus' teachings in the Gospels took the form of parables. These were simple tales that had one main point and drew their imagery from things everyone was familiar with. Things like soil and stones, rich people and beggars, vineyards and banquets. But don't let the simplicity fool you. This was a masterful strategy to disarm his listeners, to slip past their defenses, and mostly to lead them face to face with their own hearts. Two thousand years later, they continue to do the same for us. Oh, well, one of the things I always appreciated about this church. Uh, is the fact that uh, we have people from uh, multiple spiritual backgrounds, uh, ranging from different faiths to no faith, um, but still we've all seemed to find a, a home here. And some of us, many of us in the room, uh, identify as being Christian. Uh, and, and if you're new to church or you're new to faith, to identify as being a Christian means I believe Jesus died on a cross for my sins and he rose on the third day. That's all it means to be a Christian. And many of us would say, yeah, I follow Jesus. I believe that's true. Uh, I also know and I appreciate and like about our church that many of us in the room uh, aren't necessarily there um, and we're in different places when it comes to spirituality and specifically when it comes to Jesus. And I love talking to people who say, well, I'm here, but I've got a lot of doubts and a lot of questions and a lot of hang-ups when it comes to Christianity. And, and I totally respect that. I have never once asked someone to pretend to believe something they don't actually believe. I've never once asked someone to believe something that a guy on stage says, because it must be true if he's on stage, right? I don't, you know, evaluate things that way. I don't expect you to either. Um, I know that many people, when they start at this church, um, they're surprised that they're even in church. They weren't planning on going to church, but uh, someone they respect spoke so highly of it. They said, well, you should just come, and you were kind of surprised, and you don't even know what you're doing here, but okay, it's church, and, and you're kind of curious about it. Uh, for, for some of us in the room, our starting place with church is with arms folded and crossed like this because uh, you didn't even want to be here. Your parents go to church, so they brought you, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend brought you, or your spouse brought you because they're a Christian, they're a follower of Jesus, but you're not. Um, however you, you came, I, I just want you to know that I, I respect the fact that you decided to be in the room anyway, and I just have respect for people who are curious and respect for people who are open-minded and evaluate things uh, reasonably and logically and don't just believe things because that would be a little bit superstitious. But uh, what's interesting about Christianity, wherever you're coming from, wherever you're coming from, if the message of Christianity is true, now think about this, if the message of Christianity is true, the message that Jesus came to forgive sins, if that's true, Already, just neutrally speaking, comparatively speaking, already Christianity would be the best religion. Now, now here's what I mean by that before you send me the angry emails. What I mean by that is, if you look at any religious system outside of Christianity, they all have some things in common. They were all started by a founder who essentially said, I'm here to show you the way to God. I'm here to show you the path to God, and here's what you have to do, and do, and do, and do, and perform, and perform, and perform, and earn God's favor, whatever their name for God is, and if you do the right things, then finally, perhaps, God or the gods will accept you, and you will enter eternal life, whatever flavor of eternal life they have in that religion. Then Jesus came along, and Jesus didn't say, I'm here to help you find the way to God. Jesus said something completely different. He said, I'm God here to find you, and I am here to take you to eternal life. I am here to purchase your eternal life and give it to you as a gift. So, just neutrally speaking, if 
that's true already. Christianity is, is really the best religion in that sense where it's a gift. God has already done all the heavy lifting because he knows your name and he cares about you and he loves you. However, that's not all there is to Christianity. In fact, uh, if, you're, if you're new to church, what you should know is the idea of getting your sins forgiven, that's, that's really just the starting block of Christianity. That's the starting block of the Christian faith. That's where faith begins. But it leads us into a room that is so much bigger. It leads us into a world that is so much bigger than just getting your sins forgiven and going to heaven when you die. That's the entry point into a world that is so much more enriching and meaningful and satisfying, filled with flourishing and thriving as human beings. So it's no surprise that this idea that Jesus taught about, which really goes beyond getting your sins forgiven, was a topic that he talked about at length. In fact, there's a topic that Jesus taught about more than any other topic, and he called it the kingdom of God, or sometimes he called it the kingdom of heaven. More than he talked about forgiveness of sins, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. More than he talked about heaven or hell or eternal life, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven. If you just go by volume and you go by the the sheer amount of content, it seems that Jesus thought that the most important idea you need to understand if you're going to understand God and if you're going to understand Christianity is that you need to understand the kingdom of God and what it is and how to enter it and what the implications are for your life. But the challenge is most of people who do what I do for a living Kind of leave it at get your sins forgiven and go to heaven and great, what's for brunch? Well, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Well, if I could explain it in a couple of sentences, I would be a much better teacher than Jesus because he talked about it all the time trying to help us understand it. But in short, the kingdom of God is the kingdom where God reigns and rules. And because he is God and because he is sovereign and because he is powerful, he reigns and rules in a way where everything is just the way it's supposed to be. Where everything is the way it was originally designed to be. It is a place of of wholeness, of flourishing, of healing. It is a place where relationally there is wholeness. Emotionally, there is wholeness. Psychologically, physically, spiritually, economically, socially, racially, there is wholeness. It is a way, it is a place in the boundaries of this kingdom where everything is the way that God wanted it to be. And it's the way that in our hearts, in our souls, deep within us as human beings, we wish and long for a reality that could be that way. That's what the kingdom of God is. And that's the picture that Jesus had for all of humanity. And so he talked about it and spoke about it and explained what the kingdom of God looks like and how we can enter in and how we can live lives like this. But the frustrating thing and the reason why I think he had to speak about it again and again and again and again is this frustrating tension about the kingdom of God. Namely, that the kingdom of God exists already but not yet. Let me explain that. When Jesus died on a cross and he rose on the third day, We're told in the Gospels, the the biographical sketches of Jesus' life, that in the temple, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, in the temple, there is this thick curtain that divided the Holy of Holies, the place where the presence of God lived, from all the sinners who gathered to worship. And when Jesus was crucified, that was torn in two. The presence of God was unleashed into the world. The kingdom of God was unleashed into the world so that God could live among sinners because sin was atoned for by Jesus on the cross. So already, because of Jesus' death, you can become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Your eternal destination can be changed. Not someday, maybe when you die. Right now, when you trust in Christ, when you put your hope and your confidence and your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross to forgive your sins, your destiny is changed, your life is changed, your identity is changed from a citizen of this world to a citizen of the kingdom of God and already in your heart the kingdom of God advances and you begin to experience his love, you begin to experience his wisdom, you begin to experience 
flourishing. Yet at the same time, everything around us is still broken. Even our own hearts where God dwells is tainted by sin. And we still long for relationships to be whole, for for people to be whole, for the world to be whole, but it's broken still. And it is not yet until Jesus returns that it will be that way. See, Jesus, if you're new to Christianity, you need to know this. Jesus came to this world and he said, this is the first time I'm here and I came to forgive sins. I'm coming back a second time and then I'm going to make everything new. I came the first time to make hearts new. The second time, I'm making everything new. And everything broken by sin is going to be made whole. And life will finally be the way I want it to be. And it will be the way you want it to be. And that is coming. And since we have not fully experienced or know what that looks like or feels like yet, Jesus explained the kingdom of God to us so that we would have our hearts set on that and begin to experience it now. That's the kingdom of God. So in this series, we're going to spend four weeks talking about the kingdom of God by looking at parables that Jesus taught about the kingdom. Parables were just a teaching device that Jesus used. He wanted to make a point. He wanted to teach us something about God. He wanted to teach us something about us. He wanted to teach us something about life on this earth. So he would use a parable. A parable is a story. He made it up. It never happened. But it illustrates a profound spiritual truth about God or about us or about how something spiritual works in our world. And all of these are about the kingdom of God. And today's parable that we're going to look at is something that I chose because it's interesting because it's a parable about parables. Uh, It's a parable about how God uses his word for the kingdom of God to advance. And what's interesting is at the end of the parable that Jesus told, when he got to the punchline or when he got to the point expressing what this is all about, here's what he said. Here's why he told this parable. He said, here's the point of today's lesson, boys and girls. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let's pray. That, that's the point of his parable. We're like, okay, we're going to have a whole sermon and that's the point. Are you kidding me? I have ears. I'm hearing you. But what's the point? This is the point. Jesus wants to say, whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, already that tells us something that's unique about the kingdom of God. Every kingdom we know on earth advances through force and coercion. When Alexander the Great rolled into town and his empire expanded, there were only two kinds of people, citizens of Alexander's nation and the dead. Okay? It came by force, and you knew when Alexander the Great's kingdom came around. Even in democracy, it's a kingdom of coercion and force. Why? Majority vote rules. If you're in the minority, we're so sorry, but by coercion and force, the will of the majority is pressed on you. Every kingdom of earth is a kingdom of coercion and force, but not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God does not advance by coercion. God will never force someone against their will to love him. God will never force someone to worship him. It does not advance by coercion or force. It advances when you hear and you listen, listen, listen carefully. Which means that Jesus taught that the life you've always wanted, the experience of joy and peace and satisfaction and flourishing you've always wanted, it only comes when you are really listening. So here's the big idea if you're taking notes in your program. The kingdom of God advances through hearing. So are you listening? The kingdom of God advances by hearing. The question is, are you really listening? And Jesus told a parable to help all of us wherever we're at when it comes to faith, wherever we're at when it comes to God, to help all of us answer this question honestly. And here's why today is worth the price of your attention. Some of you, you come in and you would love for what I say to be true, but God just feels far away. Jesus is going to explain why today. Some of you, you've been coming to church for years and and you're a Christian. You say, yeah, I believe Jesus died for me, but... I am filled with anxiety in my life. I am filled with worry in my life. Jason, you talk about peace and you talk about joy that Christians should have, and I don't have that. 
today, Jesus is going to explain why that is. And the reason up front, and I want you to think about this as I'm talking, the reason why is because the kingdom of God advances through hearing. Are you really listening? So we're going to read through this parable, but before I do, I want to do something important. I want to pause right here before we read the Word of God. Because if this is true, I want to say a prayer and ask God to open our hearts and our ears that we can hear what He has to say today. So so please join me in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're here today, and, and I believe you have something to share with every person in this room. I believe you want to speak something to every single person here today. So I'm going to ask that we would be a humble people who have ears that are listening for you. And that we would hear what you would have us say. Or what you would say to us today. And right now where you're seated, I want you to say a prayer in your own heart to God. Asking that you would have open ears to hear what he has to say to you. And now, right where you're sitting, would you say a prayer for me that I can do a good job of teaching the Word of the Lord today? Now, Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, today we're in Matthew chapter 13, and Jesus gives us, or Matthew gives us the context for this parable. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while the people stood on the shore. So uh, my new idea after studying this is I'm going to try to convince the elders that the church needs to buy a boat because that'll help us be more like Jesus. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So they didn't have combines and tractors. They would just scatter seed. And he said, some fell along the path, didn't take root, the birds ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The end. Now, if if I were in the audience that day, I, I think my reaction would kind of be, huh? Okay, Jesus, I heard you're a good teacher and you can show us Uh, what the kingdom of heaven is like and what God's will is and and you're just this amazing rabbi and you're talking about a farmer and I have no idea what any of this has to do with God. If you you listen to this parable and that's kind of your thought, what does any of this mean? I want you to know that you are not alone. Look at what the disciples, how they responded in Luke's account. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. What does this parable mean? It's probably God calling right there. He's got something to say. Uh, so, so they didn't understand what this parable meant. They were totally confused. So if you don't know what it means either, you're in good company. The disciples are like, I don't get it. In Matthew's account, here's what they said. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? Okay, Jesus, we, we don't want to be rude here, but if you just spoke plainly, this thing would probably get a little more traction, all right? You talk like Yoda up there and no one has any idea what you're trying to get at. What, why are you using these parables? I mean, if, if, if you are the Son of God, why don't you just do stuff that makes it obvious you're the Son of God? That would make life a lot easier. I mean, well, think about it. Why is it that when Jesus was born, why didn't he just come out of the room, grab a Rubik's Cube, and solve it in 10 seconds? People would say, Son of God, right there. You know, Mary placed him in a manger, and then he solved the Rubik's Cube in 10 seconds. I, I think that's amazing. Why at his birthday parties growing up, when the pinata was hit, why didn't rainbows and fireworks come out of it? Okay, people would say, I think he's the Son of God. That's amazing. Why did he have to always hide himself? Why did he veil himself? Why in his teaching didn't he just speak plainly? Why was he obscure and why did he use these parables that not even the disciples understood the point at times? Jesus explains. He replied, because 
the knowledge of the secrets. These are not common sense. You don't notice these living in the world. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. There is knowledge about God's kingdom. This has been given to you. It has not been given to everyone. We say, well, Jesus, why wouldn't you share that with everyone? Don't you want everyone to know? Here, here, here's the best comparison I can come up with to explain why Jesus would do that. Have you ever noticed how when it comes to politics today, there are certain people who are so closed-minded, they're not even able to hear things objectively anymore. Raise your hand if you know someone like that. Go ahead. Raise your hand if you know. Don't, don't say a name. Just raise, No elbows. Just raise your hand if you know someone like that. Okay. Second question. How many of you are that person? I am so closed-minded I can't see things objectively anymore. The, now that's funny. We all know someone, but none of us are that person. Isn't that strange? See, we live in a world, and as human beings, we're people who once we make up our minds, we don't want to be open-minded. We don't want to look at the facts. We don't want to be challenged, generally speaking. And if, you're not, if you don't agree with me, you're, you're my enemy. And if we're not on the same page, you get out of here. That's why you see Republicans villainizing Democrats. You see Democrats villainizing Republicans. People are closed-minded, and it doesn't matter what happens. Guess what Jesus did? You know, I asked about why didn't he just have the rainbows and fireworks coming out of the pinata. He gave sight to the blind, and people refused to believe. He healed the cripples, and people refused to believe. He raised the dead, and people refused to believe. Many were only listening to him so they could get more ammunition to fire back at him. Their hearts were closed. And because their hearts were closed, because their hearts were hard, Jesus explains there are secrets that are not for them. They're for people whose hearts are open who are listening to what I have to say, who have ears to hear and are listening carefully. He continues. Whoever has been given, whoever has, sorry, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So he says, for those who have, because they have an open heart, they have a soft heart, they have a humble heart, God says humility is the prime value in the kingdom of God. They will learn more about the kingdom of God and grow in it. Those who have a hard heart, who are closed, even the little bit of knowledge they have about God, even that will be taken away because their hearts are hard. The disciples, although they didn't understand the parable, they want to learn more. Their ears are open. They say, Jesus, would you please explain it to us? And because of that, he is happy to explain the meaning of the parable to them. And we get the blessing because we get to hear the meaning of the parable. And this is why it explains that so many of us are where we are when it comes to faith in Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it. Now, understand it doesn't just mean I have no idea what the preacher is trying to explain. By the way, that's another way we try and be like Jesus around here. When you leave saying, what was Jason getting at today? See, just being like Jesus. Understand it doesn't just mean they don't get it. It means they have not fully realized or thought out the implications of it. If you say Jesus forgives sins, have you thought about the implications of that? That the Creator adores you. That your life has been vindicated and validated by Him. Have you thought about the reality that everything we worry about and get frustrated about and panicked about is in the part of our lives that is this long and then eternity begins and God has said, and you will be with me and it will be wonderful and you will experience the full-on kingdom of God. Have you understood it? He says, anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, they try to just fit it only into the context of this life. The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. 
Some people hear the message about the kingdom of God. They hear about forgiveness. They hear about good news, but because their heart's hard, it doesn't penetrate. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't change anything. They just keep going on with the life that they're living. So here's what Jesus is teaching here. Some have a hard heart. Some have a hard heart. Some of you who are Christians, you're frustrated because you have a family member, you have a friend, you have someone you care about, and, and, and you, you invite them, you tell them, but, but they're just not interested. The reality is you can't make them interested. You can keep sowing seeds, but you can't change their heart. That's what God does. So keep sowing seeds. God has to change their heart. But some people have a hard heart, and that's why they never become Christians, Jesus said. There's a second category. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. And the parable said, some falls on the rocky soil and the sun comes up and it springs to life, but then the sun dries it out and it withers. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. So Jesus describes the person who they hear the message, hey, God loves you. He forgives you. And it impacts them. They're filled with joy. You mean, you mean heaven is mine? You mean God is mine? You mean he loves me? And, and they're filled with happiness, contentment, satisfaction. God loves me. I'm forgiven. That's what it says. But he continues. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. See, this is the kind of person who isn't looking for God, they're looking for a cosmic butler. I want God to serve me. First, He can serve me by forgiving my sins. Then He can serve me by giving me a wrinkle-free, easy life. And when following Jesus is challenging, when following Jesus is difficult, when following Jesus costs them something personally in their lives, they bow out. Not what I was looking for. I was not interested in an actual God. I was interested in a genie in the bottle. When I rub it, it does what I want it to do. But for me to submit myself to the will of that God, whether I like it or not, that's not what I signed up for. So this is someone who hears the word. At first, they're filled with joy. But, but when God doesn't do what they want, they lose their faith. When life is still hard on earth, they have not understood the kingdom of God. When life is hard on earth, they quickly fall away. So here's what Jesus is saying. Some have a shallow heart. Some have a shallow heart. They, the world is all about them. They're shallow people. They have a shallow heart. They want God to be all about them too. Uh, Timothy Keller is a pastor and an author. He's written several books that I greatly appreciate. Um, but he says that when he's talking with a young person college age or early on in career, who grew up in church, grew up a Christian, believed in God, but then comes to him and says, you know, I've lost my faith. He says he asks them this question. Who did you start sleeping with? And they're shocked and they're taken aback and 99 times out of 100, they have a name. For me as a pastor, these are the most heartbreaking stories. People who hear the word, they get it, but they have a shallow heart. And when following Jesus costs them something, they fall away. That's the second kind of soil that Jesus names, the second kind of person Jesus describes in the parable. The third kind. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth Choke the word, making it unfruitful. Do you know who Jesus is describing here? The average churchgoer in America. Someone who says, I am a Christian, but I'm still filled with anxiety. I'm still filled with fear. I'm still filled with worry. It hasn't completely transformed my life. And by the way, of the four kinds of people, this is probably the most miserable person. And the reason why they're miserable is because this is the person who has a divided heart. 
I love Jesus, but I love the things of this world. I trust Jesus, but I trust the things of this world. My faith is in Jesus, but my faith is also in the things of this world. And as a result of this divided heart, the fruit of the Spirit never takes deep root inside of them. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is patience. It is kindness. It is goodness. It is gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the harvest the Spirit wants to spring forth from your life. But because in their hearts they're divided between loyalty to God and loyalty to the things of this world, the result is they're choked out. The harvest the Holy Spirit wants to bring in your heart is choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth, the worries of this world, by the travel soccer team so you're gone six Sundays out of seven, or the cabin up north that keeps you away from hearing the word, or we're too busy to read the Bible at home. They don't lose their faith, but this is the most miserable person because the the fruit of the Spirit is being choked out of their heart. And as a result, their lives are unfruitful. They're not producing a harvest in the kingdom of God. They're going to go to heaven, but they're going to have nothing to show for their lives. Because they have a divided heart. He said, then there's the fourth category of person. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it who understands to the depths what it means that I am a sinner. Who understands to the depths what it means that God loved me anyway. And because of Christ, He's pleased with me, and I am a child of God. And I have the incredible purpose of my few days on this planet to love God and to love my neighbor. The person who understands the word This is the one who produces a crop first in your inner life that flows into your outer life that produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. The reason why he uses these numbers, that's nothing by today's agricultural standards. In those days, a crop would yield about 10 times what was sown. They did not have the advances in technology that we do. This was mind-blowing in their days. Jesus might have all said a kajillion times what was sown, okay? In other words, this tiny seed that doesn't seem to very be a very big deal, the Word of God, the gospel that comes to you, it will transform everything about your life, and it will transform everything in the world around you. It transforms communities. It transforms It transforms neighborhoods, it transforms people, and it brings in the kingdom of God as heart by heart people become citizens of the kingdom of God. Collectively, it starts to transform the world around them. And even in this broken world, we start to get a glimpse of the hope and the joy and the restoration of what it looks like to live in God's kingdom that we will fully see when Jesus returns. It produces a crop inside of us. And the reason why is because some people have an open heart. Some people have an open heart. If God says it, I will accept that. If God is good and if God is God, then I will be His servant and I will accept the word of the Lord. So that's the parable about parables. That's the introductory parable Jesus taught to help us understand the kingdom of God. And he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So the application for a message like this, for a parable like this, is really very open-ended. But here's what I believe the proper application is for all of us to wrestle with. What is the present condition of your heart? You don't have to tell me. But you should know. As Jesus tells this parable and he describes the four kinds of soil, there's the hard path, which represents a hard heart. There's you know, the shallow soil, which represents a shallow heart that just wants God to be my butler and he better do what I want. There's the thorny soil, which represents the divided heart where I follow Jesus, but I also follow and love and trust the things of this world and I'm divided and as a result I'm miserable most of the time. But then there's the open heart, the humble heart that says, I'm the Lord's servant and and God is good and I'll trust Him. 
If you had to put yourself in one of those categories, what's the present condition of your heart? That's what Jesus wants us to think about today. Now, if you don't like the answer, what are we to do about it? Well, the answer to that was also hidden in the parable. See, in the parable, the seed obviously represents the Word of God, the good news about who Jesus is, the gospel. But what's interesting is how throughout the gospels, the stories of Jesus' life, John chapter 1 begins by calling Jesus the Word of God. John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus is the Word of God. And one time in John chapter 12, Jesus said something fascinating. He said, unless a kernel of seed falls to the ground and dies and is buried, it will remain only a single seed. But if that kernel dies and is buried, it will produce a harvest. And he said that referring to himself because he said, right now I am the only singular child of God on the planet. And unless I die, unless I am buried, I will remain the only child of God. But he did die for our sins. He was buried. And not only did he rise on the third day, but we're told that that was the first fruits of a new harvest so that all of us who believe could become children of God. Don't you see? He bore the crown of thorns for you. He was the seed that was buried in the ground and raised to life so that you can have new life. We are the harvest of his righteousness. We are now the children of God. And just like he died and was raised to life, you are now invited to produce and bear a harvest in your inner life and in the world around you. If you want to change the condition of your heart, it doesn't begin by trying harder. It doesn't begin by saying, well, I I better do more. I better volunteer more. I better give more. I better do something now. You've just become like every other religion in the world. The kingdom of God advances by hearing. Are you listening? Are you listening to how much God loves you? I mean really loves you. Yes, He knows you to the depths. Yes, He knows everything about you. And yes, He loves you. And the things that you beat yourself up over, He says, but I've forgiven that. I know you condemn yourself, but I don't condemn you, and I'm God, and my opinion matters more than yours. When you listen to that, when you understand that, that's what changes your heart. And that's what lets the kingdom of God grow in your heart. And that changes everything. Next week, we're going to continue this series. And we're going to talk about how we can lay hold of the kingdom with both hands. It's a critical message, and you don't want to miss it. But for today, what's the condition of your heart? And will you really listen? Now, to help you with that, if you were not around hope last month, here's what we did as a church. We started a 90-day reading plan, reading through the life of Jesus. If you missed it, you can still jump in. Stop by the hub on your way out. Say, I would like a copy of the reading plan. It takes five minutes a day. Start with today's reading. If you want to go back later and make up what you missed, you can. Just start with today's reading. Start hearing the Word of God in your heart. Start listening to it because that will produce the harvest of righteousness. If you were here and you would say, man, I had great intentions in January, Jason. Today's a new day. Are you listening to the Word of God? Pick it right up today and hear Him. That's going to change your life. That's going to let the kingdom of God flourish in your heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you're kind and compassionate and gracious. And we can see ourselves in this parable. And if we're honest, a lot of us don't see ourselves where we want to be and where you want us to be. 
Forgive us for having hard hearts, shallow hearts, divided hearts. We want to have a pure heart in your sight. And that comes by hearing. So today, this week, I ask that all of us will be humble and have open ears, open hearts to take in and understand your, la- your love and your grace for us. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. We desire your feelings of peace and your feelings of joy and your feelings of, of patience and gentleness in our hearts. That only comes from being your children. So through Jesus Christ, we ask for these in rich measure. Produce a harvest of righteousness in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.